Hello, hello, and welcome everybody. We are back again for another amazing session. My name is Kirsty Salisbury. I have been involved with the Spiritual Awakenings Advisory Board team. I have had the privilege to be able to work alongside our next speaker with some various projects. Our paths overlap a little bit and we've had some amazing conversations. So I'm very happy to play host for this session. Our next speaker is Dr. Nicole Gruel, who is going to be talking about awakening in intense times. Dr. Nicole Gruel is an author, a speaker, a mama, a specialist in spiritual health who descends from a 450 year lineage of samurai. She had a near death experience as a teenager and other numerous other spiritual transformative experiences since, which have inspired her to cheerlead others through their own extraordinary experiences towards life prosperity, joyful livelihood, and to become the agent of awesome that they are meant to be. Nicole has a doctorate in integral and transpersonal psychology. She's an advisory board member for Spiritual Awakenings International, and she is a certified counselor and life coach and has trained in various healing and energy psychology modalities. We're in for a treat today. So Dr. Nicole Gruel, I'll hand over to you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, and I love working alongside Kirsty in various capacities. And of course, everybody at Spiritual Awakenings International, what an incredible team, what an incredible conference. Um, I trust you've had a fabulous day so far and um, I'm sending you lots of morning love from the future uh, in Australia. So is Kirsty. she's even earlier in the day or later in the day, I should say. So Monday is a glorious day, folks, <laughs> for those still in Tuesday. <laughs> so let's get going. We are going to be talking today about awakening in intense times and just like that lotus it can only come through the mud and boy have we been in times of thick um thick 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 mud so um i promise that today's talk will get lighter but we're gonna have to trudge through a bit of mud um to get there and to help set the context of this discussion so there are lotuses aplenty don't you worry I wanted to start um, by sharing a vision that I had with you. And this was an experience many, many moons ago now, probably about oh, at least two, maybe two decades ago. And I was out at a weekend retreat and we were doing, it was like authentic dance movement. We were actually dancing through the chakras and it was this beautiful process where you dance and each time you dance through a chakra or with a chakra, it was with music that was made to resonate at that particular frequency. So it's this gorgeous journey work that's done. And it went over an entire weekend and we were out in nature. So, you know, really connected to such a safe space, right? A safe, beautifully held space. And so we went through and we were doing these dances and everyone was having a great time. I was having a fabulous time and, you know, it was just a beautiful process. And then we came to dancing the third eye. And I've tended to have some pretty strong visionary experiences through my spiritual experiences. And this one was one that blew me away. So here we are, we're dancing the third eye now. And it was as though I entered through a portal and I just got shot out into the stars. And my physical body was so ungrounded in that moment because literally I was hovering in space that my physical body, after having danced all this time, I had to curl up like a ball. It was the only way I could feel um, feel my body and feel safe and grounded in some way. So here's everyone else going wild now doing their dance. And I'm just this little ball, like a seed on the ground, not moving tight. And whilst that was happening to my physical body, my vision was in these stars out in space, just traveling, traveling, traveling. And it was like, I was like a baby. I was a baby, right? In this ancient, massive, wide, infinite cosmos. And so I'm hurtling through space, through these stars. It was absolutely exquisite, as ungrounding as the whole thing was. And I saw many things on that journey, but the one piece that is relevant to the talk today that I'll share on that journey is I encountered Oops, I encountered the suspense. 
for Earth. And I've never seen anything like this before. And this here is my very poor recreation. <laughs> it's the closest I could come to sharing with you what I saw that day. And let me walk you through. I first became aware of the earth on the right hand side there, which was pristine earth, like that jewel, you know, that, that you see from the, those shots from the spacecraft when we first saw earth pristine blue green absolutely glorious in full earthly health and vibrancy and i then became aware of this next earth that was below it and it was the one that i saw was clouded in this yellow fog smog much more than you can see in that image there like you could barely see anything on the planet it was just completely you know enmeshed in this cloud of, of ick and then I saw this red earth that looked very Mars-like. It was dry, it was crackled, there was no life form on it whatsoever. And then above it, I saw a white light earth. And again, these were all earths. These were not different planets. I knew in my vision, these were all variations of earth. And there was this white light earth. And I felt at that time, once I became of the white light earth, that there was a thread coming down from that one to the sick earth down the bottom. And I understood in that moment that we humans currently inhabit the sick planet earth, the one that is caked in all of that stuff. Yeah. And, and, and so I was looking at this, like this light beam coming down from this other earth. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I saw some movement between it. And then I understood that if we want help on planet earth right now, help is available to us. That light that was coming from that white light version of earth was, I guess it's a more awakened form. I don't want to necessarily language it or classify it. Um, I just want to describe the experience as I saw it, right, and, it, and had it. But I understood that help, whatever that help is, however that form comes, help was available to us if we were open to it and if we asked for it. So that vision happened quite a while ago. And um, it was pretty extraordinary at the time. And when I came out of my visionary state, it actually, I, I didn't have language, I didn't have words. I'm sure many of you can relate to this when you have a profound spiritual experience. And um, there was actually a woman in the room who walked over to me, she was a shaman. And she just, you know, she could see that I was in a bit of a, I'd been somewhere and something had happened. And she just said, hey, Nick, how are you? <laughs> Anything you want to talk about? And she helped me make sense of where I'd been. So that vision has traveled with me for many, many years. And again, I'm sure like many of you who've had similar spiritual experiences, there's part of your content that maybe makes sense immediately. And there are other parts of it that re reveal their truth over time reveal their message over time. And for me, this vision has been one of those things. And sure enough, the past couple of years has revealed to me, I've finally understood part of this vision that we are indeed on the planet Earth that has been very, very sick. Um, now, whether that is the Earth herself itself, the inhabitants upon it, the life form energies, um, when I refer to intense times, I'm particularly talking about the last two to three years of the big C that shall not be named, that has flipped everything on its head and changed everything um, in, in terms of life as we know it on this planet. And so a bit of an aha has occurred to me. I'm a bit slow to get these things sometimes, but a bit of an aha has occurred that, oh, maybe that's what that was. And maybe that help is available to us if we are open to it and if we ask for it. And so what happens then in this dynamic? There was this evolution of choice, essentially. We have a choice in terms of getting back to full health, full vibrancy as a collective on this planet. And we have a choice to end up very Mars-like um, and, and dry and, you know, and lifeless um, in many ways. So here we are in the midst of this time that has been harsh, the mud, 
intense um, and it has turned people's lives on their head. For many, this time has been like a bad dream. Again, as you see the puzzle pieces there, the world we have known it for many people has fallen apart. There has been no shortage of breakdown that has occurred as the world slowed down and stopped and locked. What happened for many people in my observation was the things that were going to happen anyway sped up in many ways. Things that, you know, we kept out of sight, out of way because of the busyness of life, because everyone likes to be busy. Once the busy was kind of stripped back a little bit and stopped, other pieces that had been there in the sidelines wanting to be addressed had this opportunity to come forward. And so for many people, parts of their lives became accelerated. For example, um, relationships are a big area. If something was going a bit rocky and wasn't going very well, there have been a lot of areas where that relationship so many relationships have broken apart in these times in terms of family, in terms of um, partnerships. And many of them have come together and bonded even more strongly, right? People have come together in other ways. Workplace, same thing. Many people have lost their livelihood. Many people have pivoted. Many people have strengthened in livelihood during this time. So this acceleration and shift has occurred for so many people. Health-wise as well, maybe there has become a greater awareness and taking care of health for you. Maybe you have gone through your own health challenges during this time. So again, on all of these different levels, when this event happened, and in many ways, we as a collective were forced to experience that nobody had asked for consciously. We all as individuals had to start going through the kind of knock-on effects of that. And it, it played out differently. It is playing out differently in all of our lives in slightly different ways. Um, it's, it's good to note here too that during these times in the kind of breakdown of even social fabric and caring for each other, you know, suicides have gone through the roof. I know this has been addressed in several talks through the through the um, through through this time through this summit. Suicides have gone through the roof, and also um, substance abuse has gone through the roof. Things going on behind closed doors in in terms of you know abuse within the house. All of these numbers are going up and up and up. Right? There's this destructiveness going on with self, with others, on so many levels, and it's as though the pressures of these times, the intensity of these times, has just the cracks have been um, the cracks have just been too much to bear. For many and so that energy is shifted around and dispersed and unfortunately often in very negative ways but it's not all negative as we know and i like i said we're getting to the lotuses but we've got to walk through the mud a little bit so bear with me um collectively i've heard many people describe this time as a dark night of the soul there's a few different variations of this time floating around and i'll discuss a couple but the first I want to talk about is the dark night of the soul. And it's almost, you know, when you look at the definition of hell, aside from any religious connotations it has, one of the definitions that is there is it is this perpetual place, this never ending place of, you know, bad experiences, awful things going on and just feeling trapped and like there's no way out. And I dare say that is what the earth experience has been like for many people over this time. I've certainly been speaking with many spiritual experiences that have this sense. And the dark night of the soul collectively is also this sense of, you know, where is my connection to something greater? Where is um, the, like that white light planet? Where is the aid? Where is the assistance? Where is the answer? Where is the solution? Where is my hope going forward? For many people, if you have lost your livelihood, if you have lost family members, if you have had your own health, health challenges, this can be an incredibly bleak time where it looks like these peak, rocky, raggy peaks could go on for eternity. And where is the solution? And personally, I know a couple of people who have either ended or been close to ending their life 
um, during this time. And it relates back to this sense of when will this hell, this hellish, this hellish experience on planet Earth, when and where does it end? Um, it's also been described as a near-death experience this time, a collective near-death experience. And unlike a near-death experience, and I don't need to go into that in great detail here with this crowd, but unlike your classic near-death experience that in timeline-wise is relatively brief, yeah, this one is this long, drawn-out, collective experience, almost like the birthing canal too, but drawn out in a long way where the end of who we have been has happened. There has been an ending to that. Almost like we've lost a layer of innocence on planet Earth, as we know, and something is coming up. We're headed somewhere. But because of this long drawn out nature of it, it's very much been an endurance piece the past two, three years, yes? this long drawn out nature of it, it's as though that, that light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, has been eclipsed. It's not, at least in the collective, fully clear yet as to where all of this is going and what is on the other end of it. We've ended who we were, but we haven't yet fully emerged into whatever that next piece is, that becoming. And so we find ourselves in this very peculiar, uncomfortable place. Again, for some, it feels like it could go on forever. For others, like the, the near-death experience or the near-death like, there's a sense that there's something up ahead. I know I'm on a path of some sort, but I don't quite see what it is. So those are some of the descriptions I've found in the collective in terms of describing these intense times. And really, how much can we bear? How much can individuals tolerate um, through this time? What happens when we are under these intense, changing, shifting pressures for such a long period of time? Shift happens with and without the F. <laughs> a lot of it. And it's been going on. And, and my friends, I'm pretty sure it's going to continue going on for some time. I don't know about you and what conclusion you've come to. Um, I've heard so much going on from different circles about what is taking place at this moment in time. And, you know, I'm not here to tell you what that is because you're all going to come to your own conclusions and truths about that. All I do know is that something's going on and it's requiring change. It's requiring transformation. And so we have to just nut that out a little bit. And I think the best way to navigate shift with and without, without the F at any given point in time is for ourselves to just be kind of, to lighten up as much as we can and to be a bit open to what can happen, especially when we're shifting out of old paradigms to different ones. The more we want to lock in to the old and what it was, and it's understandable, it's an understandable natural human response because we like, we like predictability, we like knowing what's going on, right? So that, that's totally built into how we operate. And yet, digging in in these times might not be the most helpful strategy as we shift to something else. And I wanted to talk about a bit too, that was about the collective. So what about the individual experiences that have been happening through these intense times? Again, as all of these pressures that we didn't ask for have been going on, or at least consciously as a collective, we didn't ask for them, but they're happening. As they go on and think of you, you can think of almost like um, the squeezing pressure of things, right? As and Anais Nin had that beautiful quote about, um, what is it? When it, when it becomes too painful, um, you have to burst through. I'm not doing the quote justice, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, right? So I'm talking about that, these pressures of these times, the intensity of this time, what happens on now the individual level? What have people been going through? So for many, it's this existential crisis, existential questions. For some, it's not the crisis, but for some, it's the questions. When you strip away the busyness of life, which is what's happened for all of us these past couple of years, these deeper questions emerge like, 
who am I again? <laughs> who am I and what is this all about? And what is actually important? Like what is really, really important aside from the things that have kept me so busy in life that I thought were so important and maybe they've occupied my life for years but as soon as that has been removed from my life for example traveling around the world doing certain things having a livelihood that demands certain things and maybe that just got shut down boom overnight like that um, maybe it's you know you've had your kids in the home and the school education and you know so that's a different level of business if you've had them in the home so these big shifts right everyone's life I'm pretty I don't know a single person who hasn't been touched in some way right so you can recall in your own life what changes have happened and what questions were called up for you in this time and it's this existential for many people this existential moment of what is the most important thing for me right now for my family as I strip it all away these core questions get asked and the ability to tap into some core values and in the busyness of life, many of us had had lost touch with these core parts of the self. And it can be revealing <laughs> to do that as an exercise to really get shown what is most important to us. Um, it can, when you get clear on that and you see it, it can actually call us into quite radical change to want to protect that or enhance that or do more of that or really cut certain things out of our lives that we now realise have not been helpful or serving in different ways. We can become much more efficient. And again, in terms of this existential questioning, you know, for some people, it's really been on that boundary of do I stay on planet Earth or not? You know, is it worthwhile being here when this is a painful planet? I don't see the point. Um, there's a whole heap of suffering around. And particularly for this community of folks who are who have either had or are very aware of spiritually transformative experiences and the people I work with, there have been many who have had an experience of something far more pleasant than the day-to-day -day earth experience. And for many experiencing this intense painful time on planet earth has actually brought up some feelings of homesickness home meaning the big h home it's brought up feelings of longing to just be there and not here on a level i've found even more intense than usually yeah more intense than usually so that i find uh, very interesting and and i've had very frank conversations with people and maybe you have too about staying here on earth or not you know so again core existential questions are showing up for folks other people have been having these mystical kundalini awakenings all kinds of things going on and maybe it's been this beautiful you know slow moving gentle awakening process and for others it's been pretty full on right and this is not just I, I found this has happened at various levels it's continued to happen for people having these kind of first awakening experiences right where for the first time the veil is removed and their eyes are open to a world of so much more and you know but i know that this community that i'm talking to you already are fully aware of this and you've had many of these experiences and the second level of people i've been talking to are folks like you who have been on the path well well awake well aware for a long time attuned sensitive doing your thing out in the world and i'm finding that even incredibly awake people many of them are having having these levels of experience that are yet again revealing new things yet again peeling back the layers in totally different ways and for many of them it's actually been quite a dark experience to have things revealed and opened in their eyes where maybe there was a lot of light before but maybe they've now seen that there's um other shades to that, <laughs> that they didn't quite want to see before or didn't want to be aware of but now here they are and what do we do with those right um even very even very spiritually awakened grounded people who are having experiences that have totally thrown them off like new stuff new content new ways of being and what do you do with that when you're already pretty you know spiritually embedded in your circles and your practices and then a new layer happens and those people who up until then have been able to support you can't because they don't understand and they're going through their own stuff as well it now adds another layer onto this intensity that is taking place 
right? So we have the physical world intensity. And when you switch on, if any of you still have a television and you switch it on sometimes, there's that level of intensity that goes on on one of the layers, layers of the collective narrative there playing out. But then beyond that layer, there are these psycho spiritual layers that are taking place and narratives are playing out on those as well. And so people are opening up and tuning into different levels of that. Some people have um, and are going through this as a spiritual emergency type of experience. And again, there've, there have been speakers to address this in this summit. And so these are those experiences where the awakening happens so quickly and in a way that um, you can't necessarily uh, ground it. You may not have the support that you need around you. And so instead of a spiritual emergence, it becomes an emergency in that, you know, life can become very tricky in those times and maybe there are even days in there where your connection to earth and earth life itself has become so you know so challenged like the basics of eating sleeping you know um you can't work you can't do certain things that just require social interaction because this process has taken over yeah it has taken over and something is coming through and emerging uh, many people in this time have turned to plant medicine. This has become incredibly popular in this time. And of course, in an era of the great unknown with big question marks, WTF is going on and WT, where are we going, right? Let me find some answers. Well, plant medicine has become a popular portal for people um, where they are able to get some answers. <laughs> and I want to put a word of caution here because as accessible as plant medicine has um, now become and as popular as it has become, especially in many underground circles, um, there are ways of doing it correctly and there are ways of doing it where you open yourself to um, experiences that can have quite challenging after effects and even challenging experiences. And so like any natural substance, um, it needs to be honoured in terms of the culture and the context that it comes from, right? And if this has been your path or if you're thinking of doing this path, um, you will know and understand that you know you have to do your research you have to do your homework and you have to feel in to the people that you will journey with because this is a conscious choice if you do plant medicine is it, it is a conscious choice to go on a journey into the the great the the bigger the more and um, in an ungrounded context, um, you know, you just don't want to come out the other end um, with more work to do, essentially. Um, you know, it, it, can, it can be a great opener, this as a tool, but, and especially, you know, if you've had past traumas um, and a lot of challenges in some way, this is not going to give you a quick solution. Even though it is used currently in the healing context, even though it is being used in terms of research to find how microdosing um, with this in certain contexts can bring about great healing and it's had excellent results. When you go out on your own um, to, to have these journeys and find someone to help you through that, again, just make sure it is really grounded and you know you can trust that experience and that it is respectful and honoring of where it comes from. And I'm talking about any plant medicines in this form. And then there are others in this time who are awaiting for the great um, disclosure, you know, the, these the presences have been with us since forever and more information will be revealed and that is coming and hold on to your pantyhose human human beings because we're about to have a whole heap more information come and so that is also floating out there too in these intense times because you know that's another conversation that we are really in star wars and there's these big galactic battles going on and earth is just one little form in this much larger picture that has been going on for eons and eons 
I don't know. Some are just waiting for the light beings to take us to a better place. Maybe that even looks like Elon Musk. He all wants to take us to somewhere, somewhere else, you know? And so again, based on your experiences, maybe, you know, are you waiting for a Messiah-like figure? Are you waiting for the great light being to come and to, to come and take you away and take you to a better place? I don't know, right? Again, many different experiences are going on during this time. And they are all, it, your experience is your experience and it is valid for you because you have experienced it. No one can take your, take that away from you. And so the truth of the matter has to be come to, has to be found through your own discernment, through your own journeying. Yeah. Finally, there are also many people who have been um, going through what Maslow termed metapathologies. And he actually thought that these were a wonderful thing. So what are metapathologies? In a nutshell, um, these are spiritual sicknesses. They are illnesses where often you might have this thing going on with you for a long time and you've been to conventional medicine and you've been here and you've been there and you've tried to find the answers to what is going on with you and nobody can give you an answer that seems to make much sense or that seems to fully answer it or address or even heal and fix what is going on. So metapathologies are, like we talked about before, one of them, like this existential, you know, the existential questioning to be here or not to be here, that homesickness, that longing for some other place that nobody else can see, but you know is real because it exists, right, through your own experience. So very awake people and also people on their journey of awakening, many are having these, they're not feeling so crash hot, right? They're not feeling great. And they're wondering what is going on aside from all the craziness in the world? Why, like, why can I not shift this? Why can I not change this? And I'm, I'm looking for the solutions everywhere, but nobody has. Well, maybe, maybe there's some level of a metapathology going on. Maybe it is a level of the soul of the spirit that is indicating something is not at ease, diseased. It is not at ease, Right. And so when something within us is not at ease, that becomes a beautiful invitation, a beautiful doorway of inquiry that we can go through in our own lives to say, OK, what is it that is not at ease in this layer of my life? And what is it going to take for greater ease in this area? It can be a beautiful approach to dis-ease. Yeah. Regardless of what kind of experience you have been having during these intense times, for many that have had an awakening or are currently going through an awakening or are very awake and are, what's the word that we could even use after that? <laughs> when there's more layers, I don't know, maybe we can co-create a word here, but the, that kind of beyond awakening, awakening, right, that can happen, those other layers that are going on. Um, shoot some suggestions in the chat as to what that word could be. Whatever that is that has been going on, if it has been going on for you during this time, then it can feel very much like we have encountered Morpheus and we have taken the red pill, knowing that we have been opened to something more in these times that we cannot go backwards from. Something has occurred to us we are now like Neo, we can see the matrix at play, we can see more going on. And so what now? The beautiful part of much of this, and we're starting to get to a bit of a lotus, lotuses now, folks, so you can breathe a bit. <laughs> One of the beautiful parts that has been happening through all of the thickness and the, the, the humbug, this is a word I learned uh, through an Indigenous healer that we um, met the other night. He works through humbug, all of that dross and that dark stuff, the matter, right, the thickness. One of the beautiful things that can emerge and has been emerging through this time is the diamonds, the lotuses, yeah? Because as you will know with diamonds, they are formed through and only through intense pressure. And that might be through the volcanoes, through the plates, the, the earth plates, excuse me, through comets even, right? Some, something massive and monumental and so incredibly intense 
has to happen and push all of these things together in order for something like a diamond to pop through. And I've started to really think that in, with all the people I've been speaking with and all of these different, you know, gatherings and summits and talks and the kind of content coming through, that this is the quality now of aha and awakening and sharing that is coming through people who have, you know, been crushed in many ways through and popped out like diamonds and lotuses out the other end. There is such a beautiful level of crispness, clarity, moving forward and knowing that is coming through in these times that is so potent and valuable. And it's, it's like, whether that's happened for you or whether you know some of these people, when you encounter that, um, that level of kind of clarity, there's a momentum about it, right? There's an aha about it. There's a beauty about it. And so we must ask in these times, are we becoming super normal? Is something really going on on our collective um, existence here on this tiny, tiny, beautiful little planet Earth in our cosmos? And the term super normal is talking about when there is a natural, lawful phenomena. So something goes on, something happens, like these experiences that we've been sharing, that presages that says there is a more advanced future stage of human evolution coming up. Could we be in that pressure cooker right now where that, you know, we've left behind a lot of forms that were not serving us anymore on this planet that had become outmoded, outdated in so many layers of our social structuring and our interpersonal and our psycho-spiritual structuring? Are we leaving some of that behind as we come through that birth canal, that portal into something more advanced, a future stage perhaps? Some have called it homo sapien lumina, right? The luminescent, the light uh, human being. I don't know. I'd love to know your, your vibe on this, your thought. I've met people who are convinced this is exactly what's going on and speak from that place of truth for themselves. I've met others that want it to happen. And I've met others that are like, Nicole, I have no idea what you're talking about. So where are you on that? Does, does that resonate on any level? Personally, for me, the one that I gravitate to most, and this is because I've, I've had experiences that tell me this is the way, but again, I'm using my lenses and you, I welcome you to use yours. Um, that some kind of a golden age, you know, and this has been prophesied as well, that a golden age is upon us. Now, there are some that have said that started back in the 70s. There are some that says this has started in 2012. There are some that are saying it's happening, you know, now. I don't know about exact timelines. Um, but this, what is this golden age? There is this, this picture that is painted both, I think, in terms of our collective imagination and also from people's experiences, their STEs and other experience, spiritually transformative experiences that they have had that inform them that there is a place and a way of being where we have had hell on earth, we've been and many are experiencing hell on earth right now. And many of us know that heaven on earth is just as possible. And this is what I understand by this golden age, right? Now you can interpret that in your own way and put the fine details to it. You know, what does that look like for you? What would a heaven on earth look like for you? Maybe you know it, maybe you're living it, maybe you visioned it and maybe you're intentioning it into being. But whatever that is, um, I feel it's a co-creative space. It's, it's only something we can get to and be in together. And for those of us who know it to be true in our present experience, then the task becomes grounding that and actualizing that even more so that it becomes more of a reality. This is also why my favorite color is gold, if gold is a color. But, um, you know, I've, I've had in many of my experiences this, um, you know, when you get gold paint, like a jar of water and gold paint and you swirl it around and it's not thick gold, but it's like little gold fleckles that go all around. It's that. Um, and that, that's the gold I've seen in my near-death experiences. That's the, the gold that I've seen in other spiritual experiences. And so when, for me personally, when I feel into a heaven on earth, 
a golden age. It's that it's that beautiful, you know, fleckily kind of gold that is there. It's just it's so it's so yummy. So, OK, great. People are having these wild experiences. The world is this really intense place. And in the midst of these diamonds and lotuses popping up and gold fleckles everywhere and the craziness and the dark nights of the soul and all of like such a mishmash of intensity. So what? <laughs> Where are you in it? And what do you want to do about it? If you've had some of these experiences, it's, it's amazing to have the experience. But what then? Right. And there's, as we know, um, of, of the great, I think it was in the 70s when um, that term, you know, the peak experiences came out. Right. And there was talk of, you know, follow your bliss. Right. Joseph Campbell came out with follow your bliss and people following their bliss. And, you know, all of those love light pathways kind of came out. And it was also recognized around that time that if you continue to peak chase, that can also become a trap in some ways because it's also a perpetual thing right where you're just carrying on with the experiences and wanting to recreate those spiritual experiences and and i can understand having been there myself i can fully understand the desire to want to recreate some of those moments within those experiences and some of those peaks but there comes a point right where we can do that we have those experiences but but then what Maybe you want to carry on doing that forever, but for most of us, it's a, okay, now I've had them, and now what comes next? Well, I think what comes next is actually where the real adventure begins. Yes, your spiritually transformative experiences, your awakening experiences are in themselves some of the most wild adventures we can ever have. But then what, right? You've had it. And I think they are actually the portal, the doorway to your life after the experience, right? What happens with that knowing? The experience happened to you for some reason, right? It was perfectly, perfectly made for you, your one or your many experiences. It couldn't have happened that exact same way for anybody else, right? Because, it, it, and this is this is just the incredible intelligence of this of this infinite cosmos that we are part of. Your experiences were crafted for you to have your specific ahas and shifts and revelations and changes. So you've had them. Now what? So now we're at the doorway. Now we are at the beginning of that great hero shiro journey. And of course, standing at the doorway and choosing to walk in to that next life, that next chapter is a choice. This is where human will comes into it. Maybe your spiritual experiences were not something that you willed or intended. They happened. But what happens with them next and what you do with them has a lot. You get a lot of say as an individual in them, right? Do I want to do anything with those experiences? You don't have to. You don't have to. If you felt a pressure on you that you've had to, you can release that pressure because, you know, you don't have to, right? I've met people. I say this now because there might be people on the call feeling that. And I know I've spoken to many people like this. They're like, but I've always felt this pressure to have to do something. You can release that pressure. You don't have to do anything. But do you want to do something? That's a slightly different question, right? Do you want to align your will with this feeling that is there, this calling, this pulling, perhaps, this magnetic pull or this pushing from behind you, however you experience it, this call, this sense, uh, do you want to align with it and find out what comes next when you engage that path? What comes next when you bravely take a couple of steps forward into the great unknown? And again, with the hero shiro journey, maybe you're like, oh, Nicole, I've done that. I've been there. I've done the hero's journey. Like, I'm, I'm so way beyond that. I get that. This journey can also be very cyclical. I felt that in my own life. I was like, oh, I've been there. I've done that. You know, no, here it comes again and again and again. And maybe again, maybe I'm just slow and that's just things that I need to learn more of. But my observation with people is especially 
people who have become very awake on their path is there are these cycles, you know, these cycles of awakening, if you will, that people go through. Very conscious, engaged, like super awake folks, again, are re-engaging yet another cycle of, whoa, who am I now? And what is going on with this? Like, whoa. Okay. So it, it can, it can come back around and go through again. And you know, one of the speakers yesterday on, on the panel was talking about how she was recreating her life again and again. That can be the power of our spiritual experiences to actually have to review entirely, okay, that life as I've known it was that, many chapters of it, and here I am, am again at a portal to step forward into somewhere else. And so wouldn't it be helpful to have a map? to walk through that and understand. And that is actually um, a chunk of what I want to share with you today. It's what I do with people that I work with. And um, I just find because I, I wanted to share this map because, you know, from my own experience, I spent a lot of years walking through what I call the spiritual wilderness, decades, in fact, of the spiritual wilderness, having all kinds of experiences. And I'll share a bit of my own story. Um, and I came out of the other end going, oh, you know, okay, I see that there was a bit of a pathway within that. Now, hindsight, the gift of hindsight is I can see that there was a bit of a pathway. And then in my work with others, as I started to work with other spiritual experiences, as I started to do the research, the patterns are so clear in terms of what that kind of trajectory, what a map through that portal and beyond that portal can look like. So um, hopefully this will be of use to you and this excites you so Want. And maybe you can even identify on this map and on this journey where you might be sitting within this current experience. But before I get into the map, um, I need to tell you a bit about my journey and how I got to the map. So uh, at 14, I had a near death experience and funny that Kirsty is our host today because it happened over in New Zealand. I don't remember the name of the river, but there's these incredible large rivers in New Zealand. You'll know it if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings. It's a spectacular country. And so we were plummeting over this 32 foot waterfall. It was 10 meter, I think 32 foot is right in, in, uh, in, in metric terms. And so we went over and um, the first time was great. It was beautiful. In fact, it was so exhilarating that we decided to do it a second time. And so we went over the second time in a raft exactly like this. Uh, it was a girlfriend and I, and then the two instructors. And we went and the second time over, the raft tipped down the bottom of the fall. I flipped out. I don't know if the others did or not. And I got plunged deep underwater because there was this whole gush. And, you know, I'm a swimmer. So I put my arms out like a swimmer does. That was the wrong thing to do because all of that water just pushed me down even deeper. I ended up in black water water I couldn't see it was like that time I was shot into space and I had vertigo I didn't know which way was up or down same thing um, I had an awareness that I was on my last breath I was filled with sheer panic and then a brief moment after that I was completely calm and in that blackness under that water I had my eyes open a horizon of light opened up again, that beautiful gold shimmery light, a horizon of light opened up. And in that horizon came towards me, my then living grandmother from my samurai heritage and my then deceased first dog pet. And I was a, I was a teenager. It was, um, it was interesting. It was special. Um, I, you know, wondered, what are you doing here? And, um, and then I got instruction. I heard a voice that said, Nicole, remember to breathe. And I recollected what to do. I curled up like a ball and because of my life jacket, I bobbed up like a cork and I took breath and I was okay. And I survived that day. And, um, you know, as, as any of you who have um, heard dear PMA Chatwater speak about childhood um, experiences, if you have an experience like that as a kid, it's quite different to when you do it as an adult, because as a kid, you just tend to accept those experiences because the paradigms of how the world ought to be are not so fully formed at that point. So I didn't make any special, it was an experience like any other experience and I carried on with my life. But something must have been triggered because I was a natural spiritual seeker. I quested, I traveled the world, I sought different cultures. I wanted to get to the essence of how we operated as human beings. 
And eventually I came to this conclusion that, you know, as beautiful and as diverse as the lights are on the outside there, ultimately we humans, all of us, we sleep, we shit, we uh, procreate, and um, many of us pray, but in, uh, sorry for swearing, I hope that was okay in this format. You can bleep that in the recording if needed. And, um, and many of us pray in some form or another, right? When you look all around the world at the different cultures. At our core essence, we humans are so simple and so much the same. And it took me traveling a world around the world and also being a very mixed heritage and very confused growing up. This is part of why I needed to figure out how we humans are and who we are, that, that the essence is very much the same. So that allowed me to start to carry on with some work um, towards people and in my understanding towards people. And then another big bang experience came. And this one was um, three days of ordinary and non-ordinary states of consciousness, spontaneous. And in it, I won't go, I go into great detail in, in one of my books, Dancing with Dragons. I mean, it's a whole book, so clearly there was a lot of content there. But in a nutshell, what happened at the end of those three days was who I understood myself to be was reduced to a pinprick of light. Nothing more and nothing less than a pinprick of light and I understood I was about 30 at that point 29 30 and I understood in that moment that anything that I create beyond or anything beyond that pinprick of light is something that I get to co-create it's something that I have active agency in in creating my name my identity the archetypal forces that I work with who I am as I interact with other people and craft something and share something in the world. All of this can be a co-creative game and a play, the great play of life, a great play in the cosmos, right? Beyond that pinprick of life, there are so many, there are infinite choices that could be manifest from that point. Now, that was a game changer, that experience. And again, it now took me into the outer world. And you might see here a pattern between kind of the spiritual knowings and aha and then how to walk in the outer world and how to be on the outside. And again, you might relate to that. And now it became clearer to me again. Oh, okay. So we can co-create our realities. So how can I get really deep into the core essence with people to help them understand and connect to their core essence and help them co-create the realities that they want? Um, and so that has very much been the path that I engaged and carried on with for years until, of course, the universe thought I needed a refresher experience. And um, boy, by this point, I, um, so where was I by this point? I completed, you know, I, I'd gone so far down the rabbit hole in these experiences. Clearly, I'm passionate about this stuff, as many of you are. Uh, you know, I'd even got a PhD in the area of transpersonal psychology because I, I just, I love this stuff so much and getting deep with people in their stuff around spiritual experiences. So I must have been quite in my head by this point around it all, right? Research based and and so here I am now in a hospital and I'm birthing my first child, my daughter. And um, it, it had been long, the waters had broken and basically three days later, um, the child still hadn't come out. And, you know, people, we'd been at home, but the people at the hospital, we'd been getting checks and they were getting increasingly concerned there for the well-being of the child because the waters had broken 90 hours earlier. So I, I was getting tired. I was exhausted actually by that point. And um, I eventually gave into some level of intervention, which I had been refusing strongly all along. And the first intervention was a painkiller, pain relief. And they gave me some happy gas, which, you know, is that stuff that they would give to you at the dentist to, to ease the pain. Well, wasn't that fun? So I was on the happy gas. I couldn't release the happy gas now. I was like Darth Vader kind of on this stuff every breath as, as deep as I could because it just felt so wonderful so it took away all the pain and um it must have been this is my rational mind but it must have been a combination of the intensity of the experience the exhaustion and the happy gas whatever it was boom in the midst of the birthing suite with all the chaos going on I was immediately I was aware that that was happening but another part of me immediately went back to that horizon of light 
that I had visited in my near-death experience as a child. So full circle. I felt it was a full circle experience, only the gift is by now I actually knew where I was and I had language for it and I knew what was going on and I could, I actually had enough within me to communicate to my partner and say, I think I'm having a near-death experience and one of us might not make it and it's going to be okay. Um, and he received that however he received that. The good news is anyway, we were all okay. We both survived it, but I felt like it was a full circle experience. And I don't know about you, but I look back on that as the cosmic, um, you know, sometimes the cosmos just has these very, this very strange, wicked sense of humor. It plays these jokes, um, the cosmic prankster in many ways, perhaps to remind us, perhaps to bring us back onto our path, perhaps to, um, you know, speed things up a little bit. So that was how this map came about for me and the map that I would like to share with you. Um, so how are we doing for time? Okay, good. Let's go through what this map is now, the halo process. And again, um, it'd be great. You can play along and identify where you feel you are um, along the way, if it works. So the first stage here is about integrating your spiritual experiences by identifying them. What actually happened to me? What was that? And by grounding the after effects, and we ground the after effects by knowing what the after effects were. Thank you, Dr. Yvonne Quezon, for contributing to that incredible body of work there and giving so much of like a medical diagnostic tool, you know, being the doctor to actually have the checklist to go in and find a lot of that. And then, so understanding what were the experiences, what have the after effects been in the long and the short term, because there are many. And now, um, what then, right? What are the themes that can come out as a result of my own journey? So what happened to me? Because often we have our spiritual experiences and our life experiences. And until we sit down and do a bit of reflection, it can feel like puzzle pieces all over the place, right? Our life can feel a bit here and there. And when we um, take a step back, and we start to do some reflective work like this and even categorizing our experiences, naming them. This is one of the hard parts if we've had these spiritual experiences, particularly if you've never had something like this before. Even finding language for what happened to me can be a huge challenge. And then, of course, how do I communicate that to somebody else without them thinking I'm completely nuts? So these puzzle pieces, this can be a stage where we understand that there's coherence between these puzzle pieces that not only do my exper spiritual experiences in this lifetime and maybe beyond play a significant role, but also my life experiences, my entire tapestry of existence is, you know, it comes together in some coherent way. And then over time, you can start to understand a bit of the timelines that play out in this and the themes. And, you know, you start to get a sense of um, even more of a coherent story or whole that has happened uh, that has happened in life. And one of the beautiful things about these stages of integration is what I call the golden nuggets. When we get clear on what has happened to us and maybe even perhaps why that has happened to us, the aha moments can start to come through these golden nuggets. Perhaps there was a lesson in one of your experiences or many lessons in terms of, you know, you, you gained, you benefited something out the other end, right? So there can be lessons in perhaps kindness, in gratitude, in humility, right? Any number of things in understanding the body in a new way, who you are accepting yourself, right? All of these, I consider these golden nuggets, these aha moments. Maybe they're beyond you personally. Maybe they're more about the cosmos and existence or human nature and how things operate, right? And their keys and understandings and wisdoms that you are here to share with others, right? So these golden nuggets can be many, many fold. And of course, the most, perhaps the most important thing I've now come to realize in working with many people who've had these experiences is um, the importance of being able to name what has happened to us, to describe it, 
to ground it and pull out the, wisdom, the, the nuggets means that we start to have the ability where we can communicate with other people about things that maybe we have held back on. You know, the monkeys, we don't, I, no, 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 it didn't happen, it didn't happen, right? And often I find people can be locked in not sharing their sacred experiences because perhaps you've had a bad experience in sharing it. Maybe you did say something to someone and it didn't go very well, <laughs> right? They, they just couldn't receive it um, in a way that you needed at that point in time. Maybe you tried sharing multiple times and that didn't go down very well either. Or maybe you just got so impassioned through your experiences, you wanted to shout it out over the mountaintop and you did and you were met with crickets, you know? And so there are many things that can happen along the way as to why people start to shut down in terms of sharing what has happened with them in these extraordinary realms. So integration is a beautiful part of um, Nicole, we, how we... We have just one or two minutes left before question time. Oh, wow. Just so oh you my know. Goodness. Amazing, oh but just goodness. so you know. Okay, I'm going to race in two minutes. This will be the fastest I've ever done this. I thought I was going to go under. Thank you, Kirsty. I thought I had 30 minutes. Here we go. I, I entered a time warp. Number two, aligning with your superpowers, getting to know the core part of you and how you operate and your gifts, right? And so this now is the who are you part. Maybe you have these crazy gifts of levitation, but for most of us, we don't. We're all pretty hardwired in kind of similar patterns. Um, and so your key is about finding out your patterning in that. We also know that in neuroscience, that is very much the case. Um, now, so that's the who are you part, finding your gifts. The third part is amplifying your zone of genius. I know what happened. I know who I am. Now I get to do more of that marvelous thing out in the world. So this is where we get talking about flow states and how you best do you. Boy, all of this flow, I tell you what, I'm just going to have to skip through. In a nutshell, for spiritual people, get your ducks in a row. You can be as spiritual as you want to be. But until you get your earthly life a little bit in alignment and order, um, it's very hard to start sharing you and getting you out there in the world. Um, because, of course, the goal is to stabilize your spiritual consciousness and live in an according way. And I'll just wrap up on the fourth point here. Um, to inspire as an agent of awesome. This is doing what you do. This is not trying to be inspiring because that's not very inspiring. This is just about doing you and being you and walking your path with confidence and with joy and with love and whatever all those golden nuggets are that you are hard through. Because when you do, you become inspiring. You become magnetic. You become what I like to call an agent of awesome. You are this force field that can bring through the great you know, the great cosmic energy that is creation itself and be a portal of creation to do something magnificent on this earth. And when we do that together, when we come together as people and we share it, that is when we get to be, I think, on that beautiful earth, you know, back to that vision in the beginning, the one that is in full health, in full vibrancy. Um, so let's leave it there for now, Kirsty. Wow. <laughs> wow, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. That was <sighs> just fascinating. You touched on so many relevant points and there's been some beautiful chat happening in the chat there. We can all relate to parts of this, whether it's going through the COVID, whether it's going through intense times, whatever's been happening in our life, but also the spiritual longing and the transformations there. So. There's something for everyone there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to give you some questions, but I wanted to start with basically a comment which I thought just underlined everything, which is Dr. Nicole Grill, your insights are profound and right on target with an exclamation mark. Just Thank you. absolutely on track, on target. So I have a question here for you. And that is, do you have a piece of advice on how to validate spiritual visions, especially when the bodily sensations cannot be easily referred to due to tensions resulting from an STE? Repeat that question again, please. Do you have a piece of advice on how to validate spiritual visions, especially when bodily sensations cannot be easily referred to 
during tensions resulting from an STE? So validation of, of visions, you know, this could be a very prickly area because if you in conventional um, medicine and psychology and psychiatry, if you go walking into most um, psychs offices these days and you start talking about seeing things that other people can't see and hearing things that other people can't hear, well, they have they have categories for you for that. <laughs> they have classifications and some even have medications for you for that. So it's such a delicate area, this one. And I believe um, Dr. Lukoff was, was speaking um, as well at this summit. And so go back and if you didn't catch his talk, catch it because he'll, he'll go right into all of that. Um, he created the category <laughs> in, in the DSM, in the, in the little book that is used. So I personally, as a coach, I find this one of the prickliest areas where many people I work with have either um, danced with the world of psychiatric care, which is not always very caring, the mental health care industry. Um, and for some people, it's been the perfect place for them. They said, that's exactly what I needed at that time. Thank you very much. And for others, they said, boy, I wish I'd never, you know, gone down that road because I'm still healing from a lot of things now. So each person to their own. So that is part of the backdrop in terms of talking about visionary experiences. Yes, it can be hard when you have profound visionary experiences and there's nothing in the physical, I think I understood that from the question, there's nothing in the physical to kind of validate that. It seems like it's something that happened. Now, what can be useful in grounding those experiences well? Artwork is incredible because it can bypass language and all of the issues that we have. So even if you don't think you're creative, get that program out of you because everyone can pick up something and put it down on paper and create shapes and colours. Anyone can do that. A, a monkey can do that. We all have capacity to just put something down on paper. So getting creative um, can be one wonderful way of dealing with um, visions. So literally, if, if that appeals to you, get a big thing of paper, massive, if you will, get some colours and just start playing around with that. That can be one way to move it through. Another, if you're someone who likes to write, write it down. Start writing these things down. If, you're, if you find that you interact better, you, you like a sounding board, find a trusted person that you can start to share with, that you can start to talk with and share about that experience. And I find with profound visionary visions, like the one that I shared with you in the beginning, I mean, this is something that I encountered decades ago and I'm still having layers of it reveal itself to me. So working with a vision can be like working with a lover of sorts, like another entity, like a friend. Maybe think of it like a friend, right? And like any friend and person in your life, if you're both open to it, you can grow and evolve in a relationship over time where you can get to know each other and different layers of each other if you're open to it. Even, you know, with a partner, decades later, you could wake up one day and go, I never knew that about you. Wow. You know, or fall, fall more and more in love with that person with, with something simple that they do. So it can be like that with a vision as well. We can journey with these things over time and be open to it revealing itself to us. I hope I answered that question. Whoever that person is, if it wasn't, then do a follow-up, please. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, I have a question here from Bill, and he starts by um, laying a bit of a foundation for his question, I suppose. He says, Heal Normality. I assume that's a book by Janet Fona. Fona? I'm sorry if I've said that wrong. Though in the high and low range of acceptable range for engineering, there can be the term normal range. But when there are outliers that fall outside the bow curve, do you think enlarge this group as outliers are outliers or is there a certain affirmative that occurs? Or is Does there that a what sense? that occurs? Affirmative. Do you consider what? by and large that this group is out, uh, this is a group of outliers or are there a certain affirmative that occurs? So um, if I understand the question correctly, it's about outliers. Are there, uh, you know, people and having these experiences being outliers? Look, I think there's a yes and a no component to this. I think if you honestly 
authentically walk your path and who you are, you're naturally going to appear like an outlier to the muggle world, let's call it, right? Every day, yep. You're going to appear like a Harry Potter to the muggles because we are in muggle world, we're all, it's such an effective system of socialization. Even from before you're born, you're being socialized by those who are bringing you into the world because they have ideas on gender, they have ideas on how you're going to be raised and who you're going to be around and the influences, right? So you're born into a family. Then you do the pattern that we all do, mostly. School, bigger school, relationships, more serious relationships, you know, job, workplace, and accumulate, accumulate, right? Family, house, da-da-da-da-da, boom, 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 retirement, done. Happy life, apparently. Now, this let's, let's just call that muggle world, right? So to anyone who actually authentically walks their path, they will ask the question at some point, which is, is there more to life than this? And of course, they will find the answer, yes, there is. And of course, for anyone who's had a spiritually transformative experience, you know there's way more to life than this. So to muggles, those on the outliers will appear like outliers. So that's the yes component. The no component is I believe that everyone has the capacity to walk their own authentic path and everybody is unique in their own way. As muggle as we might want to be, we're also incredibly unique. There is no one, no one on this planet at this time that has been created and divinely designed in the exact way that you have at this moment in time. Maybe there are shared patterns in hard wiring. Yes, because, you know, we're like plants, right? You know, oak trees are oak trees, roses are roses. There are forms, right? Humans are humans. So we naturally have commonalities in our hard wiring and structure. But within that, every oak tree is different to other oak trees. Every rose is also, and it depends on the environment that they grow in, the type of sunshine they get, where in the world they've been plotted. And we too are like those seeds. We have commonalities. We have muggle commonalities that keep us embedded as humanity, as our species. And yet we have actualized potentials that we can step into and do and evolve into and you know, discover and explore. That's the, fun, that's the adventure. That is the invitation of what this whole thing is about, is to just step into it, you, whatever that, not them, not, not find that person that's so like, oh my goodness, they're amazing and I have to emulate them because there's such some awakened, enlightened master. If that's relevant on your path right now, fabulous, do it, because what's probably happening is we call that a golden shadow. It means they are reflecting parts back to you of your own greatest potential. So that's great. If you are not ready to hold that capacity within yourself now of your own beautiful golden twinkly light, then be around people who can show you what that potential is for yourself so that you can fully start to own that. So the no part is, you know, we're all outliers if we truly stepped into what that is and we wouldn't need to use terms like extraordinary, non-ordinary, you know. Uh, we'd all just be living and doing magnificent. And, and I want to see that happen. <laughs> I want to see that happen in this lifetime because that's where it gets so exciting. Thank you, Nicole. I want to see that too. I think that would just be fabulous, wouldn't it? Now, we're right up against the clock. We're going to do one more question. There are quite a few in there. There's also some people asking about Nicole's books or books that she'd recommend. Um, and very kindly put in a link to Amazon, I believe, with the links for some books there. So just scroll up in the chat and find that link. I'll pop some this, links in as well. Oh, fabulous. Yep. So just stay behind for an extra minute while Nicole does that. Um, Julianne asks, is soul retrieval an, an effective intervention for someone traumatized by a spiritual emergency? Can be. Any, any methodology can be. Um, I'm not going to say yes or no because I don't know who you are and what your story is. Um, you have to use your discernment with any pathway you choose. 
um, find, do your research, do your research, do your homework, figure out who is that person that is delivering that modality, look into where that modality came from, um, go ask a few people who've, who've tried it and figure it out. And most importantly, above all, listen to yourself. <laughs> listen to is this something i really need is this something that really speaks to me even if it makes no sense it doesn't have to make sense but if you have a knowing within you that that is going to serve you and benefit you then sure why not give it a go mm, fabulous thank you absolutely Kirstie. perfect thank you Thanks so everyone. much nicole fabulous thank you